Welcome to Mobile One The Grid. Coming up, can Checo take the top step in Baku? What it takes to be a MotoGP racer? And the impact of a maiden win in NASCAR? In today's Mobile One The Grid with endurance racing and the hypercar team who continually punch above their weight in the WEC. In a season dominated by the factory teams, one privateer has been booking the trend with podiums and a sensational victory in the World Endurance Championship. I founded Jotra nearly 20 years ago now. I was a budding racing driver. Myself didn't have the budget to do it, so set up a team, got some partners on board, and actually when I stopped driving for the team, the results got much better. Well, I've been part of Jota now on and off since 2016, when I first came out of Formula One into the world of endurance racing. So we've been together quite a while now, from when they were a relatively smaller team up until now where we're fighting the manufacturers in hypercar. So proud to have been part of that journey from the start. When the hypercar rules got announced, it was the natural platform for us. And we've always tried to be the early adopter. We were the first people to take on the new LMP2 cars. So we wanted to be the first to do a hypercar program. Porsche approached us. We managed to get a deal together for one car last year and we've expanded to two cars this year. After 10 consecutive LMP2 podiums at Le Mans, including three victories, for the step up to hypercar, Hertz Team Jota have put together a driver lineup that's a mix of youth and experience. In the 12th car, we've got Will Stevens. Will's part of the family, part of the furniture, and he's joined this year by Norman Nato, very experienced sports car driver, and Callum Eilock, who's come to us out of IndyCar. In the 38 car, we have Jensen Button, Phil Hansen and Oliver Rasmussen. Oliver's come to us two years ago from single-seaters. Phil's a driver we've been watching for many years. He's been stellar. And Jensen, Jensen's Jensen. Consummate professional, very fast still, and really leads the team in the direction it needs to go. I think what a lot of people don't realise from P2 to hypercar, it's not just a, a different car and faster, it's so complex. You have the hybrid system, you have all of the different systems within the car, the tools that we get to play with. It takes days for the drivers to understand the systems and we're not setting up the systems, we're just playing with them. Whereas the team has to have engineers that understand the complexities of it. So it's a big step for a team and I think They've done a fantastic job. Driving with Jensen Button is one of a kind experience, I'd say. I mean, he's, he is Jensen Button, uh, the legendary Jensen Button. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It's just awesome to be able to learn by his side. There's a lot of things that obviously he does naturally, but which are not natural for me, so I can pick up on those points. It's amazing to have such a high-level teammate. From the very first time we put those guys together, from where I look at them, they look like they got on very, very well. They always ate together, they always laughed together. I think there is a lot of benefit in that. And I think that naturally does bring speed, that there's that vibe that is inclusive of everyone and they all feel comfortable around each other. With a victory at Spa earlier this season, Jota became the first privateer to claim an overall win in the hypercar era. It's testament to the ethic that Hignett and the management team have instilled. We have something called the Jota way, which is our way of doing things. I can't tell you what it is, it's just grown organically within the team and we have very good staff retention. If somebody asked me what I do, I would say I'm in the recruitment business because my job is to get the best humans to do the best job possible to run the racing team finding those skill sets, the personalities that work together. What's actually great is from when I first joined this team to now, the core group of people are still there. And I think that's super important to create the team philosophy of how we, we go racing. So all the people we add into the team fit the team mold very well and add to the current team atmosphere, which is great. And that's generally why I, I love being part of it. Coming back into racing full time, Working with a pure out-and-out -out racing team is exactly what I wanted. OEMs come and go, teams don't. And uh, this team has, has won Le Mans many times in a category where everyone has the same equipment. So they've just proven what they can do uh, as a team, strategy-wise, 
teamwork and the atmosphere that they have here in the team. Jota's impressive performance has earned them a deal to be Cadillac's works outfit from next season. This major move will be hard work, but could reap massive rewards. For this season, however, there's still plenty of silverware left to win with their pair of Porsche 963s. The manufacturers have got the World Championship and we've got the World Cup, but we always want to be mixing it in with the manufacturer teams. We want to be able to sneak a podium here and there and race for the top five if possible. And of course, respecting the people that we do race in our championship anyway, who are fantastic competitors as well. So take home the World Cup and then take some um, World Championship podiums where we can. Racing a MotoGP bike takes more than just skill. Riders need the right mental approach to cope with the pressure that comes with battling wheel to wheel at 220 miles per hour in motorbike racing's top category. One thing I think you've got to really do is keep a calm head in all situations because it's very easy to get a bit fiery and make mistakes. I would say you have to face fear, you have to face limits, you have to face crash injuries or risking your life, in a sense. You have to face rivals, which are also very good and talented. So the will and the self-belief, I would say, are the fundamentals. There's always certain dangers involved in motorsports, of course, all motorsports, but MotoGP in particular, I think we're really lucky nowadays because our leather suits, helmets, boots, all of our protective wear is so it's next level. And the racetracks have evolved so much and we have so much space that of course you do get hurt now and then, but I feel grateful that I'm in the sports in this day and age because in the past it was a lot more hectic. I think it's another one of those attributes I think that comes down to being a good MotoGP rider is you never think about what can go wrong, you just think about what could go right. Naive almost, but you're constantly thinking of the good outcome and you know obviously when things do go wrong it's always a bit tougher, but uh, you're just trying to, to do the best you can, not thinking about the consequences too much. To be honest, when you've been racing bikes and your goal has always been to get to MotoGP since you're a little child, you don't really worry about it or think about it. It's just uh, something, it's the next step in your career. When you're at the top of the sport, that's what you get. You know, you get that privilege of being able to ride over 350 k's per hour. When you're in a battle, you're trying to weigh up your options throughout the race. And I think you do take calculated risks in that sense. But I mean, getting on the bike and pushing the thing to the absolute limit comes with the territory. It's something that we've done and been injured for a very, very long time, you know, since I can remember pretty much. So. It's just every day for me, more or less, I don't mind it. The rider has to have a lot of passion. It has to be something coming from the heart. If it comes from the heart, you can go through many things. But if you are doing it because you have to, things get stuff. And I think when you do it from the heart, from the love of passion, then uh, you can get through many things much easier. Sergio Perez has yet to claim a victory in the 2024 Formula One season, but at the back end of the calendar come some of his favourite circuits, including the Azerbaijan Grand Prix and the streets of Baku. Baku has been great for me in the last few years. Um, it's a circuit where I enjoy, I get on well with the car, and we are able to score good results, you know, and, and that has been a, a very positive feeling within the car. I think it's just confidence through the weekend, developing that confidence getting at the race with a lot of confidence, being able to deliver and push the limit when, when you need to. I think that's uh, the main key. Confidence has been a key word this season and the Mexican invariably finds it in Baku. The six kilometer street circuit through the Azerbaijan capital held its first Grand Prix in 2016 and has a mix of 90 degree turns and twisty sections through the old town before a final turn into one of the longest start finish straights on the F1 calendar. Two Grand Prix victories and a runner up spot in his three years with Red Bull have helped secure Checo's reputation as a street racing specialist. I think it's really important to be able to concentrate well, to be able to deliver a strong result. 
especially because the surface doesn't have much grip and it's evolving a lot during the race. So it's very important to be able to keep reading the race, keep reading the track, to be able to adapt. The visibility can be sometimes not great, but uh, it's what it is, you know. I think it's always important to be able to, to focus on, on the target uh, during the race weekend. All his wins for Red Bull have come on street circuit, and there are three more on this year's calendar. Baco is up first on the 15th of September, and he should be brimming with confidence. It would be nice to, to get it done again in Baco. I think last year, you know, winning both races, the sprint and the main race, was uh, the best weekend I've had in Formula 1, because I won both races. <laughs> uh, and that was a very special one, you know. Um, to be able to secure that, it's been my best weekend in Formula 1. Time now to relive the moment a young NASCAR driver achieved his breakthrough victory. Last season was the fourth campaign for 24-year-old Riley Herbst in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. He arrived at his home race in Las Vegas with 138 races under his belt, but no victories. The season was kind of in a lull for sure. Um, things weren't really going how the way I wanted or anybody on the 98 team wanted them to go. Um, we started to build some momentum back in the right way, headed into Las Vegas. The practice went really well. Qualifying went, I think, pretty decent. We made some really good changes overnight to the race car and we were excited for the race to start. Josh Berry on the outside, Cole Custer on the inside as we start off the round of eight from Vegas. While his Stuart Haas racing teammate Cole Custer began on the front row, Herbst had received a grid penalty from NASCAR for making repairs to his Ford Mustang after qualifying. We had an unexpected surprise to start the race. We actually had to start dead last, so our eighth place qualifying effort got uh, negated. First stage, we kind of made our way up from last to, I think, 11th, which was decent track position gain in 45 laps. And I felt like we were going to maybe get up to sixth or seventh just because how the dirty air was playing and we weren't really that great in traffic. Herms had done well to get up towards the front while his teammate Custer had dominated stage one of the race, but the number 98 team were about to find their groove. In stage two, we made really good adjustments on the race car on pit road. And we were able to drive up to the field pretty quickly, passing really good cars. And once we were able to run with our teammate in the double zero, I felt like we had a car capable of winning and we just had to do our jobs. It's Cole Custer out in front now for the lead. Riley Hurts, the Las Vegas native, trying to take stage two. These are teammates. Hurts is going to clear him easily. And out of turn four, Riley Hurst is going to win stage two. Las Vegas was the opening round of the playoffs for which Herbst hadn't qualified, but that didn't mean he wasn't determined to beat his teammate and the other championship contenders. Stage three was pretty straightforward, to be honest with you. The biggest concern, we had to make a green flag pit stop because we couldn't make the distance on fuel, so I just had to do my uh, job correctly, go on and, on and off pit road with no mistakes, and the pit stop it went very smoothly. And the pit crew changed all four tires and gave us gas in a good time to get us to the finish and maintain the lead during the pit stop cycles. And I think the biggest emotion I felt was relief when I saw the white flag, but I wasn't too nervous or anything by that means. I was more calm, just understanding the job I had to do. Dad, I love you so much, man. I was thanking Davin, my crew chief, on the radio on the last lap, and they told me to get off the radio and make sure I complete the final lap, which was kind of funny, but uh, I was talking on the radio there on that white flag lap. They shouldn't have worried. Herbst was 15 seconds ahead of the field. Riley Herbst, a Las Vegas native, with 50 to 60 of his friends and family in the grandstands, here to witness his first ever win in the Xfinity Series. Riley Herbst, he'll win here at Las Vegas. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, you don't even know what this means, what this takes off my chest. Everybody said that I couldn't do it. I can't believe it. I love you, Las Vegas. Let's go. 
It was very emotional for sure, not only for me, but people on my team as well as my family because they've been by my side every step of the way. So it was neat to uh, share that emotion with all of us. And I remember the post-race interview. I remember just saying how big a relief it was off my back. I remember talking about the doubters, everybody saying that I couldn't do it and I wasn't good enough and I just beat everybody in the field by 15 seconds. It was a good feeling to have, knowing that we could go win these races and uh, beat anybody who shows up. Caitlin McCann is the lead trackside performance engineer for Cadillac Racing. The American looks after the two V-Series R's in the IMSA Championship and three at Le Mans as part of GM's Global Endurance Racing Program. I have a very diverse set of experiences, both on the team side and on the manufacturer side of sports car racing with GT cars, prototypes in the US and in Europe. So I think that that diversity of experience, seeing how different teams operate, the procedures, the engineering analysis has given me all of the tools that I need to put me in my current position competing at this global level with Cadillac Racing. McCann grew up helping her father's amateur racing before studying engineering and then heading to Oxford Brooks in England to follow her motorsport dreams. The hardest thing to do is get your foot in the door with motorsport. So I was trying to figure out the best path to give myself the best chance to end up with the team on a sports car endurance racing program. So I felt that the master's degree program in Europe was something that aligned a little bit better with the skill set and the connections I'd need to make to end up with a global sports car endurance racing program eventually. Caitlin became the first woman to win the prestigious Infinity Engineering Academy gaining experience with the Renault F1 team before working back home in IMSA and in Europe, including winning her first Le Mans in GTE Am in 2017. It was quite a thrash to get prepared for the race. We had just received a new car right before the Le Mans test day and there were all new electronics and systems and sensors on the car and it was my job to make sure that everything was communicating correctly and reliably in time for the race. So to, to come in and give it our all and then to come away with the victory with our first time with that car was incredible. And a little bit of beginner's luck I think too. A few years on and her role has changed significantly as she masterminds the performance of the Cadillac V-Series R's. With my current role, I'm a little bit less hands-on with the very particular intricacies of uh, car calibrations. Now I look at the bigger picture of supporting all of our performance engineers who are looking at the intricacies. I'm looking at the car-to-car -car comparison within the Cadillac program to make sure that we're maximizing performance on all of our cars and learning from each other. And then I'm looking a little bit bigger at the wider competition in our class to try to see where there's opportunity for improvement. While there's been no Le Mans victory for Cadillac as yet, there's been considerable success back home in the IMSA Championship with wins for both V-Series R's, a team title and the manufacturer's crown last season. Winning the championship in IMSA was phenomenal. The first year of the program, the first year of the cars, all of our cars race under the Cadillac Racing banner. They are factory cars that are run with our support. And so we don't pick our favorite kids. We want to see them all be successful. And if we can win some other championships later this year along the way, that'd be great too. McCann continues to enjoy the challenge of engineering race wins. And while it may be the drivers who get all the headlines, getting the best out of an endurance race is what she enjoys the most. Funny enough, I never, I never wanted to be a driver. I've always liked being the person to take into account all of the different variables all at once. So the great thing about our racing is there are so many different conditions and ambient conditions, track temperatures, you've got whatever's happening on track in terms of traffic management, you have the actual raw performance of your car, you've got to do tire compound choices, sometimes there's some rain in there. And I think the culmination of all of these different variables together is super challenging as an engineering problem, but it's also what I love. Twenty-two-year-old Frenchman Alessandro Giuretti has set his sights on the Mobile One Super Cup this season after achieving a lifelong dream in becoming the official Porsche Junior for 2024. I remember as a kid I was watching uh, Formula One uh, with my father and motorsport in general, mainly endurance racing. So I start to love the Porsche brand and that inspired me to be a racing driver. It was the feeling I got when I was watching it. I felt this amazing energy of motorsport world and I wanted to be part of it.
Porsche's new junior receives a full season entry in the Super Cup Series, as well as a comprehensive support package and coaching from a Le Mans winner. At the junior shootout in Portugal, he outshone 11 other young hopefuls to win the coveted title. At the beginning, I had like no words. I didn't know what to say, so I asked uh, Jasmine to repeat it to be sure that was uh, not uh, something wrong. And yeah, she repeated it to me. So of course, I was super, super happy. It was a dream to me to be one day junior. So to achieve this is a big step in my career. Alessandro became the Porsche junior, and um, what made him our choice is that we saw something. We saw potential. And potential means that we saw something already good and we do believe that we can make it even better. I think I just need to keep learning. I have the chance to be in an amazing program and to be the 2024 junior and have uh, Sasha with me who will help me to develop myself and to keep learning and keep doing a better job. Sasha won the 24 hour of Le Mans. He has the personal experience as a driver plus the experience as a coach. So it will be perfect for me. The drivers that we have in our program are always very talented, but they are usually quite young. So they're lacking experience and that's why I can help them. So hopefully they don't have to do all the mistakes that I did in the past. So sometimes I can prevent this, but uh, not always. On track, Gioretti has a packed schedule, aiming to improve on his runner-up position in the French Carrera Cup last season, whilst showcasing his Super Cup prowess around the world at Formula One weekends. The Porsche Mobile One Super Cup Championship is the toughest championship. There is all the best drivers around the world. They come here to fight each other, so it's really good. It's the best championship, I think, to progress and to learn. It is important to have goals because you have to aim for something. Alessandro doesn't have the pressure to have to win the championship, but of course, this is our aim. If we're going into a race, we try to win. So his goal, of course, is to become the champion. But you need luck for that as well. I'm doing three championships this year, Caracas France, Asia plus Super Cup, so I really need to be in the moment and to think only about this. But of course, my main goal is to one day become factory Porsche driver and for sure it will be the biggest dream to be part of the 24 hour of Le Mans as a factory driver one day. But yeah, right now I really need to focus on Carrera Cup and we'll see it later. Next time, we talk to Flying Dutchman Max Verstappen and meet Porsche's Aussie ace Matt Campbell. See you then on Mobile One The Grid.